Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. People are nuts. People are psycho. YouTube is psycho. Maybe that's going to be the title of this episode is People Are Nuts, YouTube is Psycho. Time for a serious chat because I'm like your mum, but with less yelling. You're thin, you have a certain privilege. The everyday tasks that a thinner person can take for granted. I can either plus size person like myself, feel full of anxiety, burden and upset and feeling that they don't belong and don't deserve a place in here. So firstly, I would not describe this girl as plus size. I think that that has become this term that people like to employ when it actually doesn't apply to them. She, at least in my opinion, is overweight. Uh, and I know that we've, we've joked about this, but though I never want to be considered like that. And I mean, people leave comments on my videos, on my YouTube videos, and they'll say things like, why is your top load cut? And I'm like, well, I mean, I don't want to be in a burqa. I mean, I, I could, if you, if you ask nicely, maybe it might happen, like a nice blue one. Oh, old and she's talking about, she's angrier than she maybe has been ever by the political noise. Well, she's a conservative. What's the political noise coming from the opposition? Right, wear a mask, stop getting other people sick, stop killing other people by being so anti-science. Uh, also, a month ago, I mean, that's pretty much at the peak of the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, yeah, you're right. All this political noise, you should be the angriest because clearly you're the person most negatively affected by what's going on and why those movements are even necessary. So the question that we're asking today is if the wage gap exists. It does not. Sydney Watson is a writer, YouTuber, and political commentator. You can find her on youtube.com slash Sydney Watson, where she has over 500,000 subscribers, on Twitter at Sydney L. Watson, and she also contributes to the First Network. If you'd like to watch the full version of this show, please go to rebelnewsplus.com and sign up for just $8 per month. Sydney, thank you for joining us. How are you? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Very good. Thank you. Uh, where are you coming to us from? Texas at the moment, thankfully. Not, uh, not like D.C. where I used to live. It's so a total, much freedom, total I'm jealous. Over there. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's actually pretty great here. When I first moved, I was like, I've made a grave mistake just because, you know, D.C. was uh, it's, it's pretty good for journalism and related things. But Texas is awesome. I can't complain. I can complain where I am right now. So I'm glad that you don't have the right to. Sydney, you, come... <laughs> Sydney, you come highly recommended by your peers. Um, your oh. YouTube channel is only about three years old, though. And your first video was called The Me Too Movement Has Ruined workplaces. So tell us what led up yeah. to you making videos and what inspired you to make that video in particular. Uh, so basically, I was actually at university at the time I was doing my Master of Journalism, and I was disturbed a little bit by how left wing it was. And I, I'd known that, you know, obviously, most universities are fairly left wing, um, having done my bachelor at the same university. Um, and I wanted to basically discuss and talk about right wing values and right wing ideas, basically to combat the left wing ishness that I was dealing with at school. So um, the first video I made was actually uh, about gun control. And I chucked that on YouTube, uh, sorry, not on YouTube, on Facebook. And that did really, really, really well, which totally shocked me. And then I decided to keep going. I was just mad that the media was so dishonest and I didn't want to be part of it. So I wanted to actually work towards being a proper journalist or someone at least, you know, who you could trust for unbiased, even though I am right wing and I always say this is quite funny, but I, I do want to be unbiased. I want to pr provide both sides of the story. So, so what particularly spawned the, um, the anti Me Too video, though? Oh, the anti-Me Too one in particular? Well, I guess I've just always had a inclination towards um, criticizing feminism as a general rule. And at that point, I'd obviously been watching um, the sort of narrative surrounding men. And, I, and, and particularly in Australia, similar to Canada, um, feminism has a bit of a stranglehold. It's a very, you know, gynocentric society. And I was just mad about it. And I figured that people needed to actually have an alternative viewpoint. And... That's sort of what came to fruition. There's a video about workplaces and how uncomfortable it is to be in a workplace as you know, men these days, I guess. A lot of the articles I saw about you called you a men's rights activist. Do you call yourself right. that? Did that come from these videos? How did that happen? Is that your own doing? No, I, I definitely don't call myself an MRA. I don't really subscribe to that sort of terminology or anything like that. I think people 
give me that, you know, label because I think it carries a lot of negative weight, mm -hmm. negative connotation. It sort of gives an indication that you're the sort of person who hates women, that you're a misogynist, that um, you don't care about actual genuine equality. And I mean, I, I think it's more of a, a derogatory thing that, that people on the left use to label people like me who are just critical of, you know, this sort of more radical sides of feminism. And so, yeah, no, I definitely don't identify with that at all. No, I agree. Definitely in the articles that I was reading, it, it was pretty clear that they weren't trying to compliment you by calling yeah. you that. Now, recently, I sort of went on a spree watching your videos, and I find myself, I found myself, I really found myself, I found <laughs> myself agreeing with a lot of what you were saying. I felt like we had very similar mindsets. I mean, we obviously look and sound a lot alike, so oh, there's... <laughs> for sure. Your hair is so long, it's so luscious. You know, I'm, I'll sleep tonight because of that. <laughs> How would you subscribe where you fall on the political spectrum? You said right wing. Was it always this way? Did you always have these uh, types of opinions? I mean, I think that I come from a reasonably right wing background and a real business background, too. So, you know, most people in my family, my brother, my dad, my mom, everyone's had businesses. And so I think that that kind of lends itself to being, I think, more conservative, at least, you know, fiscally and things. Um, my mom being from the United States, she came from, you know, a right wing background. So I suppose that I grew up with very, very right wing influences. I, these days, I kind of oscillate between libertarian and conservative. I don't think I fit you know, wholly and solely into either group. And I think that that's okay. I, I don't necessarily think that the tribalism that goes along with politics these days is particularly healthy. I think it is okay to have ideas that sit outside of um, those groupings. So yeah, you know, in essence, I have always leaned to the right. I think I've come a lot more to the right in, in the last couple of years. <laughs> Sometimes um, I, I look at what the left is doing and I just think this is, the, these are the people radicalizing conservatives and people on the right, not other right-wingers. One of the videos that struck me from the get-go when I was going through your channel and when I wanted to show particularly was about thin privilege. And uh, Justin, we could play a clip about that and I want to get your reaction, Sydney. Okay. You're thin, you have a certain privilege. The everyday tasks that a thinner person can take for granted. I can leave a plus-size person like myself feel full of anxiety, burden, and upset and feelings that they don't belong and don't deserve a place in here. So firstly, I would not describe this girl as plus-size. I think that that has become this term that people like to employ when it actually doesn't apply to them. She, at least in my opinion, is overweight. With all the pictures and the interview, do you as the editor of Cosmo even infer that this may not be a good weight to be, that this actually might be morbid obesity. And um, in Britain right now, we have the worst incidence of obesity in Europe by miles. We are a fat and ever fattening country. And here are you as an editor of a, of a very popular magazine telling women it's fine to be 300 pounds. I don't get it. I genuinely hate how people employ the terms curvy and thick and plus size to girls who are genuinely overweight. So Sydney, what, uh, what caused you to make that video? And, and why do you think this sort of stuff, uh, thin privilege, fat acceptance, like over the top body positivity, where do you think that comes from? And what made you want to make that video? I watched the clip in question, the one that I used in that video, and I watched it as, you know, someone who's been thankfully, you know, reasonably thin my whole life. Uh, and I, I just was like, what planet do these people live on? I think that there are a lot of people out there who try to excuse their own lack of, you know, personal responsibility or self accountability and put that blame onto others saying that, you know, they have a privilege or they have this or they have that when in reality it takes some you know looking inward to realize it's actually your own actions that have put you where you are and passing the blame passing the buck to someone else to basically say oh boohoo woe is me i live in a world where skinny people get to do all these things that i don't get to do honey no one's like force feeding you donuts you you can eat healthy you can go to the gym you can lose weight with the exception of people who you know are overweight due to health complications or uh, you know, medications that they're taking. I have a lot of sympathy for those people because they often get lumped in with um, the obesity epidemic. But we're getting fatter. We're getting way fat. 
people are becoming uh, lazier. We're very, you know, we have these sedentary lifestyles. And it just annoys me that someone would, would throw shade at people who, you know, basically, and I think theoretically, work out and take care of themselves. That really irritated me. And I do think that the uh, fat acceptance movement has gotten insane over the last number of years. I don't know if you're aware, you probably are, because um, you probably like live and breathe this sort of stuff like I do. But it's driving me crazy these days how people are saying that diets are fat phobic because, mm. you know, weight at any size should apply to everyone. Well, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't. Because if you're, you know, overeating or you're not taking care of yourself, and then you end up with health complications down the line, particularly in Australia and Canada, I don't want to have to pay for your decisions. Like, no. I don't, I don't want to have to pay for you for, for the, you know, the, the heart bypass that you're going to have to have in a couple of years because you couldn't control yourself. And I know it sounds harsh. People always get on me about it, but yeah, it makes me mad. It makes me mad. <laughs> now along the similar lines, um, these are topics that I try to point out to and talk about, especially on social media a lot. Um, things that people would call e-girls and the website OnlyFans, which you also did a video on and how it sort of relates to um, a sort of type of political theater. Can you kind of expand on that, what you mean about that? Uh, I noticed you were talking about people sort of, people use the term grifting a lot in terms of, especially right-wing politics with e-girls and stuff like that. Can you, can you expand on that for us? The e-girl thing is so interesting because I don't want to shame women for the actions that they take on the internet. If you want to take a photo half naked with a Trump flag wrapped around you, that's really your prerogative. <laughs> I do. I <laughs> Even... do, actually. <laughs> good. I mean, maybe you could have a really, you know, successful Instagram account. Uh, and it's funny that I'm saying I don't want to pass judgment, even though I'm over here passing judgment on people who overeat, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not infallible. And I'm not, you know, always ideologically consistent. But, the, but you know, like, when, when it comes to these women, I don't want to be one of these people that's out here going, oh, you know, you're a slut for doing this, because I don't know anything about you. What I do find frustrating, though, is that I think it delegitimizes, like, the conservative movement. And then by the same token, I'm also not a conservative or, you know, conservative libertarian who says to people, oh, what are you conserving just because you take photos like this? But the e-thought thing I think is really interesting because, and, and the video that I made about it was pointing out that there is a correlation, I think, between loneliness in men and women, but predominantly men, and uh, subscribing to OnlyFans or taking part in, I guess, maybe even obsessing over these women who, again, are taking their clothes off online for money. And particularly, particularly I was talking about the for money element. And I think that that really just goes to show that there's a really sort of uncomfortable thing happening where we've gotten so far from each other. And social media has played such a big role in making it difficult for people to connect and communicate effectively, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. And it's leaving a lot of people just very unfulfilled. So the lonelier men get, I, I really think it's fair to say that the more popular OnlyFans gets. And it, it, interestingly, too, I got a lot of flack for that video about, about OnlyFans. But I also got a lot of messages and comments and uh, sort of correspondence from people who say, I, I'm an OnlyFans subscriber and you're nail on the head. You've hit the nail on the head. I am a lonely person and I want the human interaction because I don't feel I can get it in other places. Now... I would say obviously it's not a healthy thing for young women. I have several nieces. Um, I have like thirteen nieces and nephews overall. I wouldn't want them to. Oh, wow. I wouldn't want to aspire. Want them to aspire to do anything like that. But I think that's fairly obvious. But aside from that, when I see um, adult women aspire, like doing this thing where they snap and their outfits change, or they're doing like provocative dances and they're like in their late 30s and 40s. I don't think that's a good thing to aspire to as an adult either. Do you think that comes from loneliness and having nothing to do also? Or, or what is the what is the goal? Is it just to become a social media influencer? I think, I think it's a multi-pronged, I think there's a myriad of reasons why people do these things. I certainly believe that, especially for young women, I think that the validation that people get from posting, you know, provocative things on the internet, whether that be pictures, videos, whatever, I think that there is an element of um, attention that they get, you know, with the likes and the comments, and it is addictive, that sort of pushes them forward with continuing to do those things. And it, again, it's this validation that women in particular get from the opposite sex that 
pushes this thing down the line, which is why you have websites like OnlyFans that are so popular for lewd and nude content. It's not just for porn stars, it's for everyday people who think, hmm, I get, it's a, it's a dual pronged thing. I get money out of it, but I also get all these comments and people telling me how beautiful I am. So I think that's a really huge part of it. I mean, I can testify to this as a woman, you know, when I was uh, in my teens. I, I mean, and thankfully, I'm so glad I didn't have a uh, an iPhone or an Android or anything like that until I was, I think about 19 was when I got my first one. But, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I can relate, you know, I had an Instagram account and, you know, you get all these comments and likes and things and you just think, oh, this is great. But ultimately I think it's, it's more damaging because the internet's forever. You can't get rid of that. For sure. I'm just going to go ahead and write down start and only fans. <laughs> you make a killing. You make lots of money. <laughs> I'll do my best. It hasn't worked out in the past. Um, speaking of <laughs> things that I definitely don't want to watch, the Biden inauguration. Did you get a chance to watch any of that? Um, and what were your thoughts on, what were your highlights of that? Did you get Truly, to watch I, it? Yeah, I, honestly, I, I can't watch Biden. And it's not because I don't like him. It's not because, you know, obviously, I don't like him. But it's, <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not solely based on that. It's largely due to the fact that I'm so, I get such bad secondhand embarrassment from him that when he makes a mistake or he stutters or he says something that I just go, oh my God, this is nonsense. I, I just, I cringe and I, I can't watch him because he does it so frequently that I'm just like, I don't want to be exposed to this. I just can't do it. So I did watch him. Um, actually being sworn in. That was really the only part that I watched. And I'm sitting there like tense, just thinking, please just say the words correctly because I can't handle it. I don't, I, I don't know. Is that just a me thing? Do other people feel like that? I can't watch it. No, it most of the people I talked to tried to watch it and had to turn it off. Personally, I was about 30 seconds into Jennifer Lopez singing um, God Bless America with the waving flag uh, with the 50% opacity in front of her. And all I could think about is, after four to five years of saying America sucks, um, this flag's representative of colonization and white supremacy, now all of a sudden, oh, now we love each other. And even though there's 25,000 troops out here and nobody's allowed to be here, all of a sudden let's come together and we love America, you guys. Bernie Sanders is falling asleep. Bill Clinton's falling asleep. Pretty sure Mike Pence was falling asleep as well. And it was just a show of, it was a pretend show. I mean, what is Tom Hanks doing there? What is the girl from Star Wars doing there? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so weird, too, like how star-studded it is. And I just think, it really goes to show, though, how in cahoots all these people are. Mm -hmm. I know that that's such a, you know, a lot of people think that sounds conspiratorial, but these politicians and these celebrities have all sort of, like, gotten in this creepy little, like, click together. It's just, ugh, yuck. I don't like it. Well, as far as I saw, everybody's uh, touting their YouTube numbers of being horribly low, a couple hundred thousand, and even alleging that they've been removing likes from it because it was so bad mm -hmm. and YouTube's a pretty right-wing place. But we'll get off of that. I don't want to make you cringe too much. Uh, you uh -huh. joined us, thankfully, so we don't want to scare you away. Um, during my research, if you can call watching videos research, I came across a video from a guy named Jimmy Snow. And, and forget about a t how much of a terrible name that is. Um, you're probably familiar with it, and I want to play a portion of that video to you that I found particularly, I don't know if you want to call it interesting or disturbing. Uh, you want to throw that one up, Justin? So you figure this video is a month old and she's talking about she's angrier than she maybe has been ever by the political noise. Well, she's a conservative. What's the political noise coming from the opposition? Right. Wear a mask, stop getting other people sick, stop killing other people by being so anti-science. Uh, also, a month ago, I mean, that's pretty much at the peak of the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, yeah, you're right. All this political noise, you should be the angriest because clearly you're the person most negatively affected by what's going on and why those movements are even necessary. Now, Sydney, I found... I want to see when I posted that because... He's an idiot, this kid. Sorry, continue. <laughs> I found it fascinating. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I couldn't look away for 10 to 15 minutes. It's a weird thing to me to make a video dedicated to one person's opinions for 30 minutes straight. Um, unprovoked, I believe. So what's your reaction when you wake totally up? Unprovoked. What's your reaction when you wake up and see a, a 30 minute diatribe about some guy um, that's completely about you? Uh, it's, 
It's always humorous to me when people make videos about either me as a person and just use a series of, when they straw man my arguments, because I really pride myself on putting a lot of thought into what I create, really researching it. And if I can't find information or there's a hole or, you know, something doesn't necessarily add up, I point it out because again, you know, like I said, at the, at, when we first started chatting here, I do, I mean, even though I am right wing, I do try really hard to actually provide both sides of the coin. I do want to be unbiased in as many cases as I can, even though I obviously have a slant, I, I want to, you know, promote these things. So it's, it was humorous because actually the day that uh, that video was, was posted, I was sitting outside um, with, you know, a, a coffee at actually Elijah's house. You had him on um, recently, Elijah Schaefer, and I'm sitting at his house having a coffee and he walks out, sits down next to me and, he, and he's scrolling through YouTube and he goes, Hey Sid, look at this and shows me. And I was like, ah, oh, here we go. And what's funny is that I love how they put my name in the title because you know, you either get people that are hate watching it because they like and support what I do and people who are, you know, hate watching it because they hate me. So I always find it so humorous because it's not just that someone's going, okay, well, here's some arguments. Let me like deconstruct them, but it's rather let me deconstruct this person. So I always find it really, really, really humorous. Um, I don't get offended. I don't care. I, like sometimes people bring up good points and I'm like, yeah, fine. Yeah, sure. That was like a, that was a definite hole. But for the most <laughs> part, I'm just like, a guy get get more time to you to do more better things that was such a bizarre sentence but you know you get the point anyway i actually reached out to jimmy and i was like man i've watched a lot of your content like this made me a bit sad it, it's you know hating on me for 30 minutes straight and he was like well it wasn't a hate video sid and i was like well kind of felt that way my guy and um, we chatted we sort of resolved it um he sort of apologized for straw manning me and and we moved on and and i have no ill will towards jimmy whatsoever so well, He's about to to change. <laughs> uh, the uh, thing that I found, and I hate to harp on it, but uh, he also, he, the way he talked is, is indicative of a lot of the journalists I watch, a lot of the reporters I watch. Or he, he claims he's a former conservative and he's changed, and he, I used to know nothing. But now he speaks as he has the deepest understanding of all these topics. But what he says is the most shallow and lack of lack of substance in these surface arguments. Oh, these people are oppressed. You don't understand their oppression. You're killing people. There's absolutely no nuance in anything he says. And the statements themselves don't lack any courage or and, and just require a lot of mental gymnastics, logical gymnastics to get through. Because when you're just saying you're killing grandma or you're not oppressed, so how can you understand? It's sort of like saying, um, you watch, you're watching this basketball game. You shouldn't have an opinion unless you're an NBA player. Now, how do you come to an agreement with a person like that? Because like you said, he apologized, but how mm -hmm. overall do people come to an agreement with somebody who, who isn't really willing to give their argument and any uh, veracity at all? Well, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Is when someone is straw manning you and when they are trying to pick apart your opinions with no logical context or they're not actually trying to understand where you're coming from. I think it's difficult to get mad at them. I think if someone's actually doing, I mean, to me, that's like, that's, you're doing something in bad faith. Basically, that's my, that's how I view it. But I, I really struggle to get mad at someone like Jimmy, because I think this guy is obviously, I mean, he's an ex-Mormon. Um, he's very hostile mm. towards uh, religion. And I think that when people are hurt, and I know this is going to sound like reasonably, you know, sort of esoteric and feely, but I think when people are, have been hurt by something, I think that their logical reaction is then to just want to hurt other things back to a large extent. And I, I sort of just see that in these kind of videos. But you, I mean, you're right. Look, they're, they are, they don't have any nuance, these arguments that they make in response to people like you and me and whoever. Um, they don't really actually break apart what we've said and really interrogate it and question it or, you know, provide new data or provide new arguments. They just sort of ad hominem you until you, until I don't, I don't even know what happens after that. I mean, obviously I don't care, but it's, it's difficult for me to say because I think at the time when I made that particular video in question, I was so angry because it feels like conservatism. And again, like I'm not, you know, the typical conservative. I do have values outside of that, but I think a lot of conservatives are just feeling so downtrodden in the sense that, you know, we're deleted on social media. We're censored all the time. The media hates us. Politicians hate us. It feels like there's just no comfortable, easy place to exist as a conservative besides maybe Florida, without getting your butt kicked, you know? And to then to have someone just completely not understand that whatsoever is kind of irritating. So, but I don't, I don't know. In answer to your question, I don't know. I just don't want to get mad at random people that don't impact my life. That's my general <laughs> sort of sentiment here. 
Now, the YouTube community, and by the YouTube community, I mean the people that they want to promote, which is obviously very left-leaning. I mean, you look at other YouTubers, Jake Paul isn't left-leaning, the Nelk boys aren't left-leaning, who else can I think about? PewDiePie is definitely not left-leaning. Um, mm -hmm. So, do you come across these confrontations a lot? I mean, is, is the YouTube community picking on you a lot because they, the people who are regular YouTubers, let's call them, and not political, uh, would probably completely disagree with you like this guy. Does this happen to you a lot? Look, I, it's funny. I don't ever Google myself because I get really depressed. Uh, I just start like reading things that are just patently untrue. Um, so if I haven't said something and it hasn't come from my face or on Twitter or somewhere where I have said it, it's probably not accurate. I just want to put that out there. So when I watch, yeah, people actually do make hate videos. I think they're hilarious because again, there's no substance. Like you said, there's no nuance. They're just straw manning everything I've said, or they're just getting really hot and bothered under the collar. And I'm like, if you want to make out with me, you better take me on a date. This is not, this is not the way to make it happen, fam. So um, people always get on me about the things they say about the transgender community. And to be completely fair, I actually think I'm pretty fair and reasonable towards the transgender community. I don't think that I say anything tremendously radical about it. Um, and it, and, and the, compared to other conservatives, you know, people have said to me, I don't think you go hard enough at this. And it still results in people making these videos where it's like, oh, Sydney Watson inadvertently supports Medicare for all. Well, I've never spoken about Medicare for all ever in my life. So I'm not really sure like where you got that from. People are nuts. People are psycho. YouTube is psycho. Maybe that's going to be the title of this episode is People Are Nuts, YouTube is Psycho. Sydney, we're going to say goodbye to our YouTube audience and move behind the paywall. If you want to watch the rest of the show, go to rebelnewsplus.com and sign up just $8 a month, or you can get a yearly subscription. You'll save two months that way. What are we going to talk about, you ask? We're going to talk about how you were kicked out of an apartment for being a conservative, what your inbox looked like, and your very favorite media attack, or the first one. So again, if you want to see that, you guys, then you've got to go to rebelnewsplus.com or rebelnews.com slash Andrew underscore says. Thank you for watching Andrew Says. If you want to see the full uncut version, go to rebelnewsplus.com and sign up today so you can see the entire episode where we talk about topics we can't show you on YouTube. They'll ban us.